Welcome back to Space This Week. Every Monday, I release these videos to keep you in the loop about all things Starship, spaceflight launches, and news. And we have a lot to cover today once again. SpaceX hopes to launch Starship this week. Starliner fails to launch again. China launched from the ocean and also landed on the moon. Starlink grew by another 46 satellites and much, much, much more. Enjoy. Starship is ready for launch. Let me explain. Last week's Space This Week Starship update concluded with the booster and ship fully stacked for a second wet dress rehearsal test, the final milestone required to be met for Flight 4 to be approved for launch. Before kicking off with the main event last week though, SpaceX took the time to perform some tests of the ship's quick disconnect interface and arm, as well as a test of FireX, the fire suppression system on the orbital launch ring, and we also saw a low pressure test of the main water deluge system. For reference, here's what a full pressure water deluge system test looks like. And then it was time. Tuesday saw the beginning of propellant loading into both Booster 11 and Ship 29 with both vehicles reaching what appeared to be full fill levels. Detanking then followed, you can see that happening as the frost disappears from the sides of the vehicle, and after this a full pressure deluge test took place. This was absent from the previous Flight 4 wet dress rehearsal test, hence the speculation that it wasn't a complete test, so good to see it featured here. And with all that, no more tests are required before launch. We'd of course still need to see at least one more D-Stack so that the very last pre-launch step can happen, the installation of the flight termination system. This is what blows the ship apart when a self-destruct command is sent, so for obvious reasons, this isn't installed until the very final step. So we waited for D-Stack with bated breath. And on Wednesday, we saw the detachment of the ship's quick disconnect arm, and then the chopsticks commenced the lifting, swinging, and lowering of the vehicle down to ground level, presumably for the installation of the flight termination system explosives, and this could potentially be the final ever D-stack of Ship 29 from Booster 11. The explosives are stored in this shipping container bunker, and here you can see the crew removing the explosive charges and making the long walk down to Ship 29 and Booster 11. Here they are installing the charges on Booster 11, and here they are installing them on Ship 29, meaning that we are now literally days away from launch, pending regulatory approval and assuming no snags are detected that would delay things further. SpaceX themselves have stated that they're hoping for launch no earlier than the 6th of June if the FAA grants them approval on time, so mark your calendars for Thursday. Restack of the vehicles took place on the 1st of June after the pressure hoses and quick disconnect plates were spotted to have been removed from Ship 29, indicating an imminent final restack. And there it is in its full glory. But will there be another D-stack? There are a couple of crucial things absent from Ship 29 here. For starters, it's not sporting the S29 decals like we saw with S24, 25, and 28. More crucially though, it's missing some heat shield tiles, which I very much doubt would be installed while the vehicle is stacked on Booster 11. Starship is made out of pretty heat-resilient steel though, so it's probably capable of surviving re-entry without a complete heat shield, especially since recovery isn't planned to feature here. The ship will just crash into the ocean if it survives re-entry successfully. So SpaceX probably aren't too concerned if it sustains some minor damage as a consequence of these missing tiles. I would personally be very surprised if this isn't the final stack, and we'll just see Ship 29 launch without decals and with those few tiles missing. What do you think though? Let me know in the comment section down below, and remember to drop a like too if you're enjoying things, it really helps support these videos. Anyway, back at the production site, we saw the rollout of Booster 14.1. This isn't a full-sized Super Heavy, obviously, but rather a test article, presumably sporting some upgraded or otherwise modified properties that SpaceX need to test and validate before implementing them into a flight vehicle. It was rolled down to the Macy's test site for testing. SpaceX kept up their crazy Falcon 9 launch cadence last week. We saw three Falcon 9 missions in total. Two of these were Starlink missions, taking place on the 28th of May and the 1st of June. Both missions saw the delivery of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites to Starlink Shell 6, and both vehicles made successful touchdowns on SpaceX's shortfall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, marking the 10th landing of Tuesday's booster and the 14th landing for Saturday's booster. 
There was a non-Starlink Falcon 9 mission last week as well. This was on Tuesday, and the rocket carried the joint mission from the ESA and JAXA, the Earth Care Mission, which is shorthand for Earth Cloud Aerosol and Radiation Explorer. The satellite aims to enhance our understanding of how clouds and aerosols affect the Earth's radiation balance, utilizing advanced LIDAR and radar technology to provide unprecedented data to study the intricate relationships between clouds, aerosols, and radiation with high accuracy. We got a beautiful shot of it being deployed to sun-synchronous orbit, and we also got a great third-person camera angle of the Falcon 9 first stage coming into land at Landing Zone 4 at Vandenberg Space Force Base, completing this booster's seventh launch and landing. What didn't launch last week was Boeing Starliner. Another launch attempt was made on Saturday of this long-delayed spacecraft, but sadly it's being pushed back again due to some issues with the ground support equipment at Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 41. So not an issue with the spacecraft itself at least. Hopefully we will see the next launch attempt launch successfully, finally giving the US a second crew-rated spacecraft for missions to the International Space Station. Speaking of the International Space Station, the Progress MS-25 spacecraft autonomously undocked from the station's POISC module last Tuesday in order to make way for Progress MS-27. This launched aboard a Soyuz 2.1A from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on Thursday. The Progress spacecraft are Roscosmos's crew resupply vehicles, and MS-27 delivered over three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the station's crew, successfully autonomously docking to the Poisk module on Saturday. China had a very successful week of spaceflight last week, with a successful moon landing, spacewalk, and three orbital launches. Tuesday saw the first spacewalk for the Shenzhou 18 Taikonauts on China's space station. Commander Guan Fu Yi and Guan Su Li, I'm really sorry if I butchered those names, worked outside the Wentian laboratory module, with crewmate Kong Li assisting from within the Tianhe core module over the course of eight and a half hours. The following day saw the launch of a Ceres 1S from a sea platform near Haiyang in China's Shandong province, carrying four Tianqi satellites for China's Tianqi Internet of Things constellation. What's interesting about this launch was that it was actually pretty close to shore, an inhabited shore at that. Check out this perspective filmed from a resident of a nearby apartment building. Must be pretty insane to see orbital launches from your living room. <laughs> the 30th of June saw two more Chinese launches. One of them was another Ceres-1 rocket, this time carrying five satellites to orbit from the Jichan Satellite Launch Center, two satellites being technology demonstration platforms, while the other three were Yunyao-1 satellites, which are meteorology satellites operated by the China Academy of Sciences. The other launch on the 30th was a Long March 3BE, which carried Pakistan's Paksat MM-1R to geosynchronous orbit. The satellite will be used for communications and is equipped with nine antennas and 48 transponders in the C, KU, KA and L bands. I think the biggest space story of the week though has to go to China's successful moon landing. On Saturday, their robotic Chang'e 6 lander began its powered descent down to the lunar surface, successfully landing in the Apollo crater located in the South Pole Aitken Impact Basin on the far side of the moon. The lander has already begun drilling for samples and will eventually return them to Earth as well as conduct scientific measurements of the lunar environment. In addition to drilling, it will also collect samples from the moon's surface with a robotic arm. Loud Aerospace was also pretty busy last week. With the cancellation of KSP-2 all but confirmed at this point, it's time to return to KSP-1. And I launched the first episode of a series in which I intend to expand the Kerbal race to the farthest reaches of the Kabola system. With colony mods, station mods, planet packs, basically I'm just gonna keep adding mods until the game becomes what KSP-2 should have been, really. The first episode featured the introduction of graphics mods and restock, and in it, we established a relay network and scouted out a location for our first major surface colony. And so, if that sounds interesting to you, then it should now be on screen as one of the clickable cards. If you want to support my channel, then I do have a Patreon page and a YouTube member program that you can join, just like all the people on the left did. Big thank you to all who did and who helped make this content possible. But that is the end of today's video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one, which is going to be a more comedic KSP video. I'm quite happy with how it's coming along, so look forward to that.